Today is the 1st of April 2015. Does he though? And you we, think it wasn't? Um, we have here with us Trevor Montes. Hello Trevor. Hello what, honey. What, what year were you born? I was born in 1935. Right. What are your earliest memories? Uh, the first memory was uh, coming out and the midwives smacking my bum. <laughs> very first memory. And if anybody can remember that, they're very good. Yes. Honey, my first memory, that's very difficult. Uh, very difficult. Uh, I always think that my first memory was on my fifth birthday. Uh, for some reason or other, because I remember an incident of my fifth birthday and I can't remember anything on my fourth, my third, my second and my first. So that answers your question. So 1940 would be the first thing I remember, but that's only an incident, not a, a load of hard facts. Right. Um, I suppose you had brothers and sisters. Yeah, I have one sister. Yes. One sister, Yvonne. One sister, and no brothers. No, no, just the, just the two of us. What sort of relationship did you have with your sister? Well, very good relationship. Very good relationship. She and I get on like eyes and fire. She's three years older than me, and unfortunately she's not in the best of health and hasn't been for a number of years, so she's in a nursing home and what have you, but yeah, I'm due to see her tomorrow morning. Right. Um, can you remember what relationship you had with your grandparents? Uh, vaguely, again, because uh, I was born in 35, and uh, my both grandparents were dead and buried before I was six years old. So I have a very vague memory and sometimes photographs will jog the memory, but uh, it's, it's not clear. No. How long has your family lived in the Whitehead area? Uh, the, two, the two sets of grandparents, uh, Monteith and Fleming. My mother was Fleming, uh, my dad was Monteith, and uh, the grandparents both came uh, uh, let, me refer, let me refer, let me have a little note here. Uh, uh, the Fleming family came to Whitehead in the very early 1900s. Uh, as I maybe tell you later, they opened a big grocery shop in 1902. And the Monteith family, uh, my grandfather worked in a hotel in York Street in Belfast. And in 1920, he came down to Whitehead while Whitehead was just starting to build up and he opened, well, he bought an hotel and a promenade called the Marine Hotel, which he opened up as the Esplanade Hotel, and it remained as the Esplanade Hotel up to uh, not so long ago. So that's the grandparents are long established business people in Whitehead. What about the Fleming family? Um... Yeah, well, the Fleming family, that's, that's, that's my, my, my mum's side. Yeah. And they, they uh, her, her parents had the big grocery shop on Chester Avenue, right opposite the Whitecliffe Hotel or pub as it is now. And that's that's where they came from. Uh, along before that again, which I don't recall at all, they were in Ballycarry. Fleming family were Ballycarry, but the Whitehead they moved up to Whitehead uh, in the early nineteen hundreds and ran that shop all their lives until uh, everybody got that little bit older. And in fact, the property as it stands now, uh, there's now flats and shops at the bottom, uh, were, was in the, Monteith fam in the Monteith family because it was Fleming's, but then it came to my sister and myself and we owned that property and only sold it in the early 1970s. Has any of your family ever immigrated from Northern Ireland? Ah, uh, no. Emigrated, you mean by far away? Yes. Uh -huh. No, nobody emigrated. My, my yeah. uncle, my father, one of my father's brothers, uh, moved very quickly to live in England when he was a young man, but that's not really emigrating. But he, he left Whitehead. Yeah. Where did your mother's family live? My mother's family was the Flemings, mm -hmm. so they lived in that shop that I'm telling you about. Well, not the shop, the house above it. You, Hannah, yourself must know that the, 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 the premises just opposite the White, the, the, the White Cliff Bar in mm -hmm. Chester Avenue. Mm -hmm. 
That is a, a massive house. Mm -hmm. And in one of my drawers at home, I've got the original architect's drawing of the house because my grandfather built that, had that house built and shop built for himself because they ran the grocery business, which if you look at any of the old pictures in Paddy O'Donnell's books of the Fleming grocery shop, it was originally right up beside the railway station where you had uh, shops there. There was a chemist shop, there was a mm -hmm. silver strand shop. Mm -hmm. Well, that was originally my grandfather's first shop. And if you look at the old photographs of that, you'll, in 1902, you'll see a photograph of my grandfather with a little girl holding his hand and that was my eldest aunt. My mother was the youngest of the girls and this was the first girl, that was 1902. So uh, the Monteith and Fleming families have both been in my head since the early 1900s. Do you know how your parents met? No, I don't. Other than in the, those days they were both locals in the town, and you didn't jump in the plane and go off to Tenerife for your holidays, so you probably spent a lot of your time with your locals, so I have to take it that they were just local, two locals who got on, played together and what have you. Yeah. How did you meet your wife? My, my I have to go, as you know, two wives. First wife was Patricia, and I worked in the bank and uh, Patricia worked in the bank uh, in Belfast. Uh, I joined the bank in 1952. Uh, Patricia happened to be, happens to be, fit. she's still alive, but we're not married now. Uh, she's five years younger than me, but I met her. She was a member of the staff in the same office that I was in for a while. And that's where I met her. How long were you courting before you got married? Uh, we, we see, when we got married in 19... 62, so I have to say about four or five years. Not very long, four or five years. Did the whole family ever get together on special occasions? Uh, the whole family? Uh, oh, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Now, it depends which family you're talking about. Are you talking about the family I had when I had the family? Or, yeah. We, 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 i uh, put it to you this way, the, the, the Monteith side, which was the hotel, the Esplanade Hotel, uh, that was uh, a, a, a biggish hotel for those days. And uh, as a young fella, I remember well on Easter, uh, Christmas and what have you, my grandfather and grandmother who ran the hotel, they would have all the connection down there for celebrating whatever festival it was. And in their big lounge, and I can always remember this, in their big lounge, there was a massive table, which to my surprise, one day when the maids came in to get the table ready for the meal, the, underneath the, t the leaves of the table, it was a full-size billiard table. But it was a massive table, and as a result, massive room, and we had big family gatherings uh, down there on the Monteith side of the family. Uh, the Fleming side of the family, uh, both my grandparents died. Uh, never met my grandmother Monteith. No, my grandmother Fleming, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, she was dead and buried before I was born. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather Fleming, I can only remember by uh, pictures and what have you, and photographs. And if you look in one of Paddy O'Donnell's books, one of the favourite one with the photos in it, or the one with the photos in it, uh, Ah yes, well that's that's the old Wild West picture. That's my grandfather. I'm now looking at the at Paddy's book with which are the photographs. That's my grandfather and my auntie Lily there. Right, so this is page forty four of Paddy O'Donnell's black book, picturesque white head. And right on the corner of Fleming's chemist is a figure with and you know who these people are. Oh yes, yeah. Yes, well, absolutely. Wow. absolutely. I don't think anybody else would know, but I was told many, many years ago yes. either way because there's a very old, this is, there's postcards of this. Mm -hmm. If you look old postcards, you yes. this with it. And you see this plot of land over here? On the left, yes. Yeah, well, that, that's where the, the, the shop I'm telling you about, he, he knocked this down and built the new place over here. It doesn't appear in this book as a photograph. And that's where they had the, the big shop and house there. And my mother was born... Uh, 
No, my mother was born. Very good question. I wonder where my mother was born. So the because that's her old, that's her eldest sister. Yeah. So the little uh, girl. You know. So uh, unless my mother was born after this property was built here, I'm not sure. And it's still there today with the round towers on the corner of. No, Chester no, it's the next Avenue. one. It's the next one after the round towers. Oh, the second one. Yes, if you're oh. sta standing at the top of. Marine per going, going down to the Marine, marine Parade. Mm. Yeah, you have the towers there. Then the next one, oh, yes. much bigger, and that that is now flats, I think, and shops in the bottom. Yes. But that that that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, I obviously do not remember that yeah. scene. You know, that's oh, nineteen hundred and two. Yes. But that's it. Very good. So yeah, so I don't remember any family gatherings on the Fleming side, because my grandmother was dead and buried before I was born, and my grandfather died when I was about uh, four or five, I think. But there, in that same book now, Steve, there's a lovely photograph of my grandfather Fleming's funeral, which is coming up past uh, uh, the Haverin shop, well, not Haverin shop, now the post office, Mm -hmm. been driven by the, the black horses. Mm -hmm. uh, I often wondered why I wasn't at the funeral, but then it suddenly dawned on me, uh oh, oh, you might have been alive and kicking, but you weren't at the stage of going to the funeral. So it was my uh, my father and his brothers and what have you. Children were not brought to the funerals in those days. Probably not. Probably that would not. would have been too scary. Probably not. Yeah. I'm trying to think, Stevie, where that picture is, but it's the one of the... Uh, Oh, I can remember it. Yeah. I've seen it here. Yes, yeah. they're all right. Oh, it's a posh, it's a posh picture. I mean, well, your family must have been belonging to one of the top families. Well, that it is. Maybe he's turned up here. Page 47 of picturesque white hair. Yeah. Now, the, the three men behind here, I'm having to guess, but my grandfather in there had a family of four, but they were all girls. Yes. Of which my mother was the youngest. And she married my father, who was a Monteith, and uh, two of the other, her sisters married, and those are the other two husbands. The, the other sister, my Aunt Evelyn, uh, was partially blind, and all her life she never married. But that, I have to assume that those are the three grand, three uh, son-in-laws. Yes. Walking behind their their. Uh, your wife's husband's. Uh, was that but, normal for a funeral to be uh, like that in those days? I couldn't tell you that. But I mean, uh, you can still have those sort of funerals, as you know. You can get the black horses and all. There was that one recently. But that's, that's what that is. So... I don't know whether that answers or deviates from your question. Oh, yeah. Annie. And then I'd like to ask you, how many people were in your immediate family circle? Well, in the immediate family circle, uh, I mean, there was just my sister Yvonne and myself, uh, mum and dad, but then my dad died in, in 19, 19, 31st of December 1944. So I was only nine year old when he died. But uh, that was our family circle. Of course, there was aunts and uncles and other children about, you know. Uh, that, that my aunt Lily, who's the one in that picture there in 1902, uh, she grew up to have three boys. And they were my three first cousins. And we were very close to them. They lived in Whitehead uh, for quite some time and then disappeared off in different directions. But that was the family circle, really. Mm -hmm. uh, How many rooms were there in your house? Now, which house are we going to now, Harry? Where, well, okay, to tell you how, where I came into the picture then. Yeah. Because I was born in Bangor uh, in 1935, 23rd of March 1935. And uh, as far as I know, probably within 1937, I was... My parents had decided, right, we're going back over the loch to Whitehead to where we came from. I think it was probably to do, my father was a chartered accountant, and I think it was probably to do with where he was working. 
Uh, I think he was, was maybe working in Bangor or that area at that time. But anyway, there's nobody about to tell me the correct answer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I came back to Whitehead there and uh, as a baby and lived there. And we lived in Cable Road, 58 Cable Road, which was a property my grandfather Monteith had bought. Uh, he obviously was a man of visible amount of wealth at that time and he bought quite a lot of property. And uh, he bought this house, 58 Cable Road. And I didn't know at the time, but, but lo and behold, it, as it turned out, it eventually came and was left to me. But I lived there with my mum and dad. And then my dad died in, in 19, uh, 31st December 44. And my mum and my sister and I continued to live there right up until uh, 1960. That's when I left Whitehead for a while. We came back, obviously, but... So I lived, my life was all based on 58 Cable Road Whitehead and all my recollections of Whitehead are from that house. Did you have any outside um, amenities? Uh, like, uh, for example, an outside toilet? Uh, yes, we, we had a, an outside toilet. But got to tell you here and now that I never heard the toilet flush. We, had, we obviously had one inside, but th there was a, an outside toilet. But it's what would you call out in your yard, what Northern Ireland people call their yard. And we had a coal house, two coal houses, and between them, between the two coal houses and the wash house, was this little toilet. Very seldom used, except if I was trying to hide from somebody. I'd maybe go to the outside toilet. Oh, and pardon me, the wash house, is that for laundry? Uh, the wa wash house was, yes, for laundry. It, it would have been... In the earlier days, the time my mum was bringing us up, she would be washing in the house, but there was a wash house yes. with a basin and what have you. Right. No dishwashers, no washing machines no. or anything like that. Mm. Washing board and what have you. Mm. Yeah, wash house, that's what they were called. When you were young, did you have mains water? Oh, yes. Yes, well, I, I, all my life, yeah, I'm old enough to have nothing but mains water. And also you had mains electricity. Oh yes, absolutely. What can you remember about the types of furniture you had compared to the modern days furniture? Well, to, to tell you the truth, yes, modern furniture has changed a lot from the old furniture then. But basically it was the same, only different. I can't really tell you much else. I can remember the couch and the settees in our lounge in, in Cable Road. Uh, and I can remember that it was a leather with a big, lovely, great big brown leather chair. Mm -hmm. I sit in a brown leather chair now at home. So, I mean, things have changed the same, only different. How was your home heated? Oh, home was heated just by a coal fire uh, in the lounge and what we just call a range in the kitchen, which was also coal burning. So everything was coal or perhaps wood. Was that like an aga? Uh, well, uh, uh, first first steps towards an aga, really. Uh, yeah, it, it would have been, that would be a posh name for it, really. But yes, it was arranged, uh, heated with coal and what have you, and then hot plates on top. Yeah. Were there any items you or your family had that you considered to be a luxury? Uh... It depends who you're comparing it against, but uh, we no, we didn't have anything that I would really call a luxury, and in, in that most of other people in the Cable Road, for example, had much the same things. There would be houses that wouldn't have the things, but we we didn't have anything exceptionally luxurious, really. My my father having died early, my mother was left as the breadwinner, and her breadwinning efforts were to uh, run a B and B in our house. So that that was not a great money money spinner. Right. So you're telling us here that the tourism hadn't really started then. No, no, no. It it was starting, and and in Paddy's book, Paddy O'Donnell's book, he, he talks an awful lot about the tourism, but the tourism came in in. Uh, really uh, Devaney's time when he had the hotels and uh, I remember those times well. I, I was, that was an older stage in my life. Uh, but when I was young growing up, 
Uh, it's not to say that there were B and Bs and tell you my mother ran a B and B, but the sort of B and B she had was really something of a more permanent nature. She liked to have a permanent B and B person, and she had a number of those gentlemen who worked in Lady Belfast, but uh, needed accommodation out of town. Yeah. All right. Can you describe the types of toys that children played with when you were young? Well, I can only remember the types of toys I had, and, and when you call it, call it toys, I mean, uh, you started off with a three-wheel tricycle. Uh, uh, you had the normal sort of dolls and things that anybody would have, but uh, no, nothing nothing too, too uh, flashy, shall we say, because maybe of the money situation in the house. But uh, certainly it, it didn't cause any trouble. My sister and I uh, lived a very good childhood and were brought up well. But uh, I can remember the old, old sort of toys I had, but the same sort of toys that some child has now, only of a different type, you know. No plastic ones, probably. What sort of relationship did you have with your neighbours? Oh, excellent, excellent relationship with, with all the neighbours. Uh, I often say now that... Uh, Having lived in Whitehead most of my life, yet get part of the story, I, I left Whitehead approximately for 20 years, but most of my life, because I'm now 80, that means 60 odd years were spent in Whitehead. Uh, I uh, can remember fondly the neighbours in Whitehead, and, and in those days, you've got to say that neighbours in those days were not only the person on your right and your left, but really practically through the town, because anybody you talk to about Old Whitehead will tell you that everybody knew everybody, because Whitehead finished at the, the bowling green. There was no, Hill McGee Road didn't exist, there was just the bowling green, and uh, at the top of the Cable Road uh, it, it finished. There was no Brooklyn's, nothing like that. Uh, where we are now in Windsor Avenue and Adelaide Avenue finished. Uh, but then across the railway lines, there was no development on the Isle McGee Road. Isle McGee Road, when you turned the corner at the top of Chester Avenue, that's up at the top, you turned left and oh, you couldn't see anything but fields. Uh, so uh, that's deviating a bit. Uh, a very good relationship with, with all our neighbours, both close neighbours. And, and I, I drive down Cable Road in the car now and I'm forever going down and saying, when I was a young fella, Mrs. Brown lived there, Mrs. White lived there, Mrs. Green lived there. You know, I can go back. I'm only using those names, they're not true names. And you never locked your doors in those days? Oh, no. Uh, you, did, you didn't really. I would say at night time going to bed, probably my mother turned the key on the door, but no, you didn't have to. Can you remember what sort of um, people came visiting, selling their stuff, like the fishman or the baker? Or... Yeah. Oh yes, well you had in those days, you, you did have the carts and the, the vans going round. Uh, you had you had your shops in the town anyway, Whitehead always had a, a good smattering of shops. But yes, you had you had the, the, the local the local uh, bread man, uh, you had the English bakery, which is a big Northern Ireland baking. Uh, uh, you had fish men, you had the, the butcher, it was Haverin's Butchers, which was in Whitehead up mm -hmm. to not so many years ago. And um, Mr Haverin which would be the present Haverd boy's great-grandfather probably, uh, went round the houses with his van, but at the same time they had a shop. Uh, th those, those were the, the sort of things you had. And, and the milkman, the milkman was, our milkman was up at the top of the Cable Road called Wisdom, and uh, he, ca he came round with his bottles of milk, rattling his bottles of milk at the crack of dawn, uh, but every... Or a day or so, my mother would send me up to the farm for an extra pint and just walked up to the farm and went down and got your With pint the jug? No, no, I would have gone up. No, no, I would think I would have been bottles in those days and I would have oh. just gone up and got an extra bottle or two. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think it would have been a question of a jug. No. Uh, but if you'd lived next door to the farm, you might have just gone over with a jug, but I just went up and got that bottle of milk. Yeah? Yeah. What were your favourite meals when you were younger? Ah... Uh, Food, food, food was a big thing. Uh, I, I must admit, uh, uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed my food. My mother cooked well, uh, because because of our means, she, she didn't. We didn't have uh, uh, 
leg of lamb one day and pork and the next day, you know, we lived frugally, but we ate, we ate well, and she cooked well, she was very cooked well, steak and kidney pies, mince, mince, to this day I, I love uh, a plate of mince, a shepherd's pie, uh, one thing I always remember well, and everybody, your family, it would be the same, there's certain, th certain things I remember and often say to my sister, what did we have for pudding on a Sunday night, and she would say cold rice. And we did, we had mother big lovely plate of cold rice with the, the, the thick brown skin still on it. And I can just see it, I can see the dish and what have you. But we, we, ate, we ate well, there's no doubt about it. I, uh, I can remember potatoes, as were a lot of Irish people, potatoes would have been a, a, a big favourite. I love spuds, I always loved spuds, so that was no problem to me. But I ate well. How many meals did you usually have in each day? Oh, well, well, I would have, uh, it depends on what time of what life we're talking about. But as a young fella, I would have had a breakfast before I went out, but it would be the sort of breakfast I would have now. I, I don't sit down every morning to fry, I sit down to porridge, porridge, uh, toast and a cup of coffee. I would have done much the same. Uh, when I went to work, I worked in Belfast in the bank, so I uh, had my lunch. Uh, and it would have been a, a quick lunch in Belfast because my mother would have cooked a meal in the evening. So I would have had a cooked meal in the evening when I came home. And in those days, supper was a bit more prevalent than it is now, I think. And we'd usually have had a, a bit of supper every night, whatever that might have been. It might have been a sandwich or a bit of apple tart or something. Uh, so that, that was it, standard, standard three meals a day. Were you able to grow any of your food yourself, like a Kitchen, uh, well, you could, you could have, but my recollection of, of our place was that we didn't really grow much in the vegetable line in the back garden. The front garden was a garden with for lawn, shall we say. Back garden was big and rambling. And now I, I live up behind my back garden, and I, every time I walk down, I look over the fence and look at that back garden and think, that's where I spent most of my life. But to answer your question, I don't remember many carrots and potatoes and and cauliflower coming out of the ground. I think we just went down and uh, mother bought them in the shop. You've already been touching upon what you loved, like the rice yeah. dish there. But are there any other delicacies that you remember looking forward to? Well, uh, fish was always one that we, we, we loved, loved fish. And in those days, it doesn't happen now. Uh, as a young fella, you would dine uh, and depending on the time of the year it was, but we caught lots of fish just on the shore here, around Whitehead, on down to, down to the gardens, uh, mackerel, herring, uh, all sorts of fish. So I, I, when you ask about fish, I, I, I always liked fish, and my mother, I, she would never clean them. I would have to bring them home and clean them, but I didn't mind that. Uh, so, so how did you actually catch those, from the boat? Or? Oh yes, oh yes, well I spent most of my life down at the, boat, at, at the shore. Uh, and my father was there before me. He he sailed and he had a boat, and I I just followed on from him. Although unfortunately, tragically, I didn't have a life with him. But uh, I I just took to the water the way he had, and I had a boat. I had a, first of all, I had a canoe. Uh, all there was, was a crowd of young fellas there, a real good crowd of young boys, all down at the yacht club. The yacht club was the yacht club I'm referring to. It's still the same bricks and mortar, only changed a wee bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all built canoes, we built canoes ourselves at one stage. And there would have been up to about 12 kayaks, as you would call them. And we all get, they were all given names of seabirds. Mm -hmm. And I can remember mine was called cormorant. And cormorant is a common black bird that you see out on the sea. You, anybody would tell you what it is. Another name for it is a skirt, but cormorant, and that was mine. But uh, not, that, uh, not that I would have fished from the canoe because any much, too much movement in the canoe and you'd be in the water with the fish. Mm -hmm. But I had a rowing boat and, uh, there were, you know, we, we fished, uh, rowed the boats. And, but in those days there were a lot of fish in the loch. And not that there were uh, four pound uh, cod or anything like that, but we just stood on the battery wall there along the promenade. You see the men now with their rods trying to fish there. But we just stood in the battery wall with our rods, threw it out, caught when the fish, that's when the fish were in, and you caught plenty of fish. I have to say, I'm amazed you made boats 
Did someone teach yes. you? What was it? No. Made? Well, the boat, oh. the boat, I, the boat I made was a canoe. Yes. A canoe, uh, which was not difficult. It was done from kit. Right. That was not difficult. Although I did need help because I'm not just the best with my hands in the building line. Yeah. But but there were men down in the yacht club who built their own lovely boats. Oh, yes. our men were very skilled in those days. Yes. Very skilled, yeah, and they, they built uh, punts or what rowing boats as they were called, but we called them punts. That was small rowing boats, uh, and bigger craft were built. Uh, the main the main yachts that I was involved in there were the, was the Waverley yachts, which was a class of yachts which were in Whitehead Bay for many a year, uh, and I I would have sailed in the in the Waverleys uh, just as a crew member. I never owned one. Yeah. Although my my mom, two family did, my father and grandfather owned one of the Waverley yachts long before I came on the scene. Number one, and you remember all the names. Number one, it was called Rowena, Rowena. Oh, and, yes. uh, but anyway, I I spent most of my life down at the shore. But that's where the fishing came from. Mm -hmm. But when you ask me about my food, I've mentioned fish. But I mean, uh, I would have eaten anything. I love my food. How often did your family eat out or have a carry-out? Well, eating out in my day growing up was not eating out as it is now. And I do not really recall going out, eating out with my mum and my sister. I do not recall that. Uh, but carry-outs, yes, oh I, the local fish and chip shop was the favourite. Uh, and we would have carry outs there. There were a couple of fish and chip shops in Whitehead. But I don't recall in my day as a young fella going out for a meal with my family the way now they do. You know, it's all changed, restaurants all over the place. Well, when I was growing up, that was not the case. Just It wasn't just so common for people to go out and dine. But there you are. Communications. How do you recall of methods of communication used when you were younger? Methods of communication? Yeah. Not too sure where you're coming from on that one. Yeah, like, I suppose telephones or it doesn't give any... Oh yeah, well, well, well telephones, yeah, they, they, they were introduced when, when I was a young fella. And I can al always remember uh, we had a telephone exchange in Whitehead. Okay, and if you had a telephone and you were going to ring a number, you lifted the phone and Jeannie down in the telephone exchange said, yes, what's the number can I give you? Oh, is that you, Trevor? <laughs> well, it wouldn't have been me, it would have been my mother. But we had a telephone and lo and behold, it was a red telephone. Now, most telephones were black, but we had a red telephone. Uh, and its number was Whitehead 117. Now that's going back that I can remember and I can see the telephone sitting on the mantelpiece uh, and yes that was used but not the way you, you use telephones. Now you decided you ring a friend in Denmark so you just left your phone and dial what it, it was you were put through and sorry I can't get you through, ring back later. Well uh, I was only a young fella then and I don't suppose my use of the telephone was very little. I would think my, my mum and my dad before that would have been the people used the telephone. But that was right. Uh, communication, yeah, that, 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 that was on the go. Uh, I don't know whether you call television communication or not, but television had come in in those days. Next question, honey. What says, local uh, newspapers did your family use? Uh, the, well, the names may well have changed, but uh, it was re my re recollection was the local paper was the Lauren Times. And the Lauren Times went on for a long time and became different names and became part of the Belfast Telegraph Group and all changed. But the local paper would have been that one that I can remember. Plus, of course, the, the Belfast Telegraph. Everybody sort of lived by the Belfast Telegraph in those days. Uh, and that, that's what we would have got. And that would have either been delivered to you or you just collected down at the, at the, the paper shop, as it was called. When did your family get uh, radio or TV? Ah, uh, well, the first TV came in uh, in my day uh, when I, uh, when was the coronation? Fifty, what was 52. it? Fifty-two. Fifty-two, right. 
Okay, we got our te first television, I think, in 50, about 54. A black and white rented one from Baird's Rental, which I, in the book that we have now, it appears, my little comment about it, that I think we had that for something like 30 or 40 years. Uh, it was a great old black and white, but there wasn't at that time, I'm not saying there wasn't a colour TV, but Jimmy Brown and Mary Black didn't have coloured TVs in those days. Uh, so we had that TV and I can remember the first day it was delivered and I wouldn't go out of the house that night because I was going to watch TV and I can't remember what the programme was but I clearly remember it was all to do with a, a sailing vessel and I can remember that, the big sailing vessel in the stormy sea and that has just stuck in my head as the programme that was, one of the programmes that was on the first night in 1954, I think. I started work in 1952 in the bank, and I think it was 1954, before I had enough money scraped up to say to my mother, I'll pay the rental for this TV. Very and when I, when I went to change the TV in uh, to get a coloured set, when coloured was in, no, no, I tell a lie, it was still black and white, but it was a much more modern set. I joked with them because the long the length of time I had had the TV that I thought I should get a a, a, a certificate or a, a grandfather <laughs> clock or something, but they just laughed and said no. Most people have been renting TVs for us for a long time, so that that was that was if that's communication, you know. What schools did you attend, and how far were these away from home? Well, the first school was, was right at the primary school, which was in those days called Public Elementary. That's what anybody listening to this programme of my vintage would know them as. But it's what they call primary school now. And I went to Whitehead Public Elementary School when I was five years of age. And that was uh, up uh, Victoria Avenue, up at the school, just below the chapel. It's now, it's now a, a, a private dwelling. But most of the kids in Whitehead went there to start with. And that's that's where I went to, and I wasn't there all that long. I went, I presume, when I was five. And another thing, two things I can remember when I was five. You asked me earlier on, and one of them was when I went to school, and I went to school when I was five. And a friend of mine lived on up the Cable Road and was two years older than me, and he was already at school two years. So my mum says, right, call for Trevor. You're taking him this first day to school. And he took me to school. And we went down Cable Road and we turned up, which you would probably not know by name, is Puck Lane. It's the wee lane opposite Balmoral Avenue that runs up to the, the back road. It's called Puck Lane. It's a very narrow lane. You only go up it if you, you know the lane. But I went up there and I can remember we got to the top of the lane and the tree on the left hand corner that was growing there when I was five year old, it was still growing there. And I stood underneath that tree and I said to my friend Gordon, I ain't going to school. I don't want to go to school. Well, your mum couldn't accompany you. And it was raining. And I didn't want to go. But I went to school, of course. But that's, that's where I started and I went there. And uh, I w was at school there until I, I was about nine, ten, uh, because my father died then uh, from... Uh, a disease that would be cured now, but could not be cured then. He was in his early 40s, it was real tragic, mm. but he died and he was a member of the Masonic Order. And the Masonic Order had two big schools based in Dublin, which if you wanted uh, orphans of, of men who had been Freemasons could apply to go to the schools. Well, uh, I wouldn't have known anything about this, of course, <laughs> I was already a youngster. Mm -hmm. But I, I went to the boys' school and my sister went to the girls' school. So we were both educated down in Dublin. So I went to the boys' school in January of 1946 in Dublin and uh, was a member of that school until 1952. So I was educated down in Dublin. But of course, I was home from all the holidays and all that. But it was a boarding school. Boarding, okay. Yeah, so that's where I was for most of my education. Right. What did you enjoy most about school? Well, for a start, you, 
being at boarding school, the first question might be to people, did you enjoy boarding school? Because it's slightly different being at boarding school than being at home and seeing your mum every night and going to bed and getting up and getting a hug in the morning. Mm. But uh, every boy or girl, probably not every, but I think a fair 90% of them, you know, find that a problem at that age, you know, just being something to the 100 miles down the road to a school uh, and not seeing them for till the next holiday came along. Uh, but I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed school more than more on reflection than actually at the time probably, uh, but I enjoyed it. And once I got a sports good over the first year or two, and was no longer the youngest new scut in the school when you get all the chores to do. Uh, it was a small school; we only had about one hundred and six people, so there wasn't an awful lot of boys there. You got to know everybody; it was a family. Uh, so I, I, I enjoyed the school and it was exceptionally, exceptionally well run. Exceptionally well run school. How many children were there in your class? No uh, well, we, 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 were, we were small, you see. Uh, if we only had 106 boys, uh, each class would have been, I would have to say, average uh, t 10 to 12. You know, that's it. It was that that's had it had a very good reputation for education because you got a very much one to one. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had a problem, the teacher knew you had a problem and he could concentrate on you. I was a total failure because it made nothing out of me. You see. What can you remember about school discipline? School discipline. Discipline. Mm -hmm. Oh well, at boarding school that was very strict. Discipline was very strict. Very strict rules, regulations, and what have you. You had had to toe the line. Uh, it was a tough regime compared to being at home. Uh, you were you were up early in the morning. Uh, food was food was not good because uh, I went there in forty, forty six. So the war had just finished, uh, and I that was the Republic of Ireland. That was era then. That was certainly court, court. You'll not be so good with your history and geography of Ireland, but that was era. It was a different country, and. Uh, uh, they were not at war, but there was problems, uh, and food was not top of the list as regards being A1, uh, so the food was not good. But discipline was very, very strict, as you would expect at a boarding school. I could go three whole days routine for you at a boarding school, but we haven't got four hours to spare. Yeah. What sorts of games did you play at break or lunch time? Uh, well, break, break and lunch time, there weren't many games that you played other than uh, going out to the playing field uh, in, in uh, winter time, kicking the rugby ball around, what have you, trying not to get too dirty before the bell went to go back to the school. Or we were a very big cricket school, very, very, very big cricket school. Top, top. We were top, top school for years, winning many cup because a number of our teachers were had been former pupils themselves and they got on to qualify as teachers and came back and uh, they, the cricket was a big thing. So you had a quick game of cricket, uh, we had a gymnasium which was not well equipped but at least you could do, play in it, uh, but it was good, good, good fun. Were there any school outings? Yes, there were, but very few, very few school outings. Uh, the best thing was to be uh, playing on a team, be it uh, rugby was the main winter game and cricket was the main summer game. And if you were on a team, and there was a senior team, a junior team, uh, uh, another team below that, and then an under 14 team. So if you got on a team uh, and you were at a boarding school, you were either playing a team from another school coming to you or you were going to them. So those were looked upon as outings because you got out to some other school. But there were not, there was one day in every month, which was called Board Day, which was the board governors met every one month. Second Tuesday, I think in every month, the governors of the school, if they wanted to come to the board meeting, came on that day. And that day was always a, a school holiday. So we had a school holiday every one month, one day in every month. Uh, which was much looked forward to, and uh, you could get out then. There were certain restrictions about getting out. We were just the outskirts of Dublin, and they just didn't say, right, there's the front gate, out you go. You know, it just wasn't as easy as that, but it was good. Have you maintained any close contact with any of your classmates? Yes, I have, yeah, yeah. I have, over the years, kept, kept close contact. 
because of the age factor now there's not so many about but uh, uh, once once a month I, I do meet with a group of them and uh, yeah so how I many don't. are left well I, I would not know where they all are now you know they're 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 spread all over no, the place. But, but the ones you keep in contact with. How, how many would there be? Uh -huh. Oh, there'd be. Uh, I suppose when I say click keep contact, that doesn't mean I'm meeting them every Wednesday, you know. No. Uh, but I would say there's there's a good dozen. I have I've, uh, a couple of boys. One one in in, uh, in the United States. Uh, one in Australia. Uh, and we'll keep in touch with them, but that, that's of course by, by email or by letter. How do you think your quality of education compares to that of your parents? To that of my parents, I would have to say much, much superior. Because of the schooling that we got, the small numbers at our school, the particular school we were at. Although my dad got a good education, he went to well, Belfast Academic Institution, he went there. Mm -hmm. He got a good education he must have because he came on to be a chartered accountant, which takes a bit of brain work. Uh, my sister, we went to the Masonic Girls School. She was she was clever too, she did well. Uh, but I would say I would say our education in our days in the early in the nineteen hundreds was, was a step up from what they what they had mm -hmm. done before that. What sort of transport did people use to get to work and shopping, etc? Well, in Whitehead, in those days, not, not, not everybody had a car. Uh, my family never had a car until I was the first person in our close family to, to have a car. Uh, that's, I mean, very close family. Uh, I, I bought my first car from my wife's grandmother. And that was in the 1960s. But here in Whitehead, well, I, I worked in the bank and I uh, went to work every day on the train, just like everybody else. We were very, there were cars on the road, but anybody who had a car when I was a young boy was somebody who had a wee bit of extra money behind them, you know, you could. Mm. But uh, m m most, most of the, the transport to and from work was done by bus and by train from Whitehead. But there were the lucky few who had a car and went by car. But not like now, the street the roads are packed going to Belfast mm -hmm. in the morning. How common was the use of a bicycle? Oh, very common. Oh yeah, everybody had bicycles. I can remember my first bicycle of my own. It was a Green Rally Lenton, which was a, a lovely bike, which I got when I was down at school in Dublin. Uh, it cost me £12.50. And I can remember buying it out of the shop, and uh, eventually I, uh, I brought it home, and then eventually to Whitehead. This was a, during school term. I bought it down there in Dublin, and I brought it home to Whitehead when I came home from my first holiday, and then I had to leave it there. But as I got a bit older in school, I found that some of the senior boys were allowed to have bicycles, as long as your mother wrote and said I allowed Jimmy to have his bicycle. So uh, I would have used my bicycle uh, at school when permitted. But around Whitehead, uh, there were a lot of bicycles about. Oh yeah. When did the use of horse-drawn transport cease in this area? Well, honey, I can't put a, I can't put a, a, a date on that at all. But I do remember the horse-drawn transport, and the best one I can relate to in Whitehead was our coal man, Dowther's coal man, who had a, a coal yard up off. Between, between Balfour Avenue and the Cable Road, uh, off the what you would maybe know as Canning's Lane. There's a lane right opposite the entrance to the church car park. That you know the church car park. If you come out the church car park, look across, there's a lane going up. Well, if you go up there now, there's a building and a development into the right there. And to answer your question, that was one of the coal yards. And that coal yard, every day, the coal cart out going up and down with the coal. They, there was a lorry as well, but that was the last bit of uh, horse transport that I remember. But I do remember when I was a young fella, the bread and the milk and all those were. But when they actually ceased, I, I, I really don't know yeah. when they ceased. Right. The war years. 
you were obviously quite young during the Second World War. Yeah. But you do recall how it affected your immediate family or the local community? Uh, not, not a lot, because uh, the Second World War was 1939-1945, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can only remember, and it, it's in our little uh, book called Southampton Living Memories, uh, all I can really remember is that uh, my dad taking me up to the, the black hole, you know, at the corner up at the top, yeah? Uh, as a lot of other children were taken, maybe not to there, but to other parts of the town, uh, to see the, the Blitz. And, I, I, and that's my recollection of the, the, the activity in the war, the Blitz, was one night, Dad taking me up there and stand there and just... Was that the first Blitz? Uh, I wouldn't know. I would not remember because no. I can't remember no. exactly when he took me up. No. But I remember standing there and the you know, sky was just... Mm. I mean, other cities all over England were getting it. But I mean, all I could see was the Belfast uh, Harbour were getting blasted out of Kingdom Come. Uh, and I don't remember an awful lot more about the war except after the war. Of course, the war had ended. Things were very tight, as you know. And uh, I do remember the restrictions that were placed on mothers and bringing up children. You didn't get everything you wanted and you didn't get all the food you would like. The rationing. Rationing, yeah, oh, yes, yeah. I remember the ration books. Yeah. Well, I have to ask, do you remember any of, of the blackout? Because yes. I imagine the lighthouse stopped yeah. shining. Everything had to stop, yeah. Hmm. The, the, the best bit of blackout I can remember publicly in Whitehead was... Uh, the cinema we had a cinema in Whitehead. Well, we still we still have the the building, but it's not a cinema now. Yes. Uh, but uh, you queued to go into the cinema, and you quite often you would queue to go into the cinema because it was very popular. Uh, but they built a wooden shuttering all round the outside of, out of the the cinema. You know the sort of shuttering you'd find if you're up at Belfast and the workmen were working in a building. Yeah. And so with the footpath, they would give you a sort of tunnel to walk through. Yeah. You know, so that a brick wouldn't fall on you. Yeah. Well, you had that right round the side of the cinema, uh, and that was to black out any lights from the cinema. But yes, in general, I mean, uh, during the war, uh, I can remember vaguely my mum being very conscious about lights being on and blinds yeah. being pulled down and all that. Oh yeah, I don't honestly remember what, what happened to the lighthouse. I can't, I can't tell you what happened. Right. Did, it, did it? Did anybody else mention that? Did it stop flashing or? Your Mycroft interviews. Oh, yeah. well, well, I know. I can't remember reading through this. That there was it, but I mean, um. Well, I'm curious if you were in the yacht club, yeah. as a kid, would you ever have run into Johnny McAdam, or Basil Sherry, or Desmond Henshaw? They were the three men. They wouldn't yes. be much older than you who yeah. were lost in World War II. I yes. Because you mentioned the Waverley Yachts. And yes, that. yes, you've, you've hit on the right, the right people there. I, I knew the family. Uh, McAdam uh, was, uh, I know the house they lived in, the, the father. I can't, I don't remember, bearing in mind that, that lad, McAdam, who died in the war, was older than me. Yeah. So he wasn't a contemporary of mine. Uh, and the same, the Henshaw, you mentioned Henshaw. Yeah, it was a Desmond Henshaw, Desmond Henshaw was one of right. four brothers. Right, I, yes, I lived in 58 Cable Road, and the Henshaws lived in 58, 56, and 54 Cable Road, yes. okay? And the whole family lived there, and I remember uh, his brothers who survived. Yes, John Henshaw. John, John, yeah, yeah, John yeah. Henshaw, he, he was a notorious John Henshaw. He was commonly known as John Hen. Yes. John Hen. Very, very capable man. He he was in the war. He was in the in the navy. Uh, he knew he knew the waters inside out. That's why he was Mister Yacht Club. He knew everything about the sea. Yes. And I knew John Wall. And then there was Desmond. Uh, others, but the lad who was killed, I didn't remember him. Mm. And then you mentioned another name. Well, Basil was like, Sherry was in a Wellington bomber. He was right. a short fella, and he was in the Boy Scouts. Well, Sherry, I can't even remember the Sherry surname in Whitehead, mm -hmm. but doubtless they were there. I, I just can't recollect that yes. name. Yeah. But the other two families, I remember, yeah. uh, McAdam, his dad, was a great artist. Uh, and John Henshaw, one of the surviving Henshaw, married uh, Mr. McAdam's sister. Uh, yes. yeah, that, Josie, that, the lad, the lad. Josie, Josie McAdam became Josie Henshaw. Yeah. I met her. You're yes. exactly right. Yes, Josie. Yes. Yeah. 
she lovely was brilliant. lady. She lovely. Was, she was fabulous, yeah. She, she, she was a great lady. I remember, I remember her well. Did you ever meet the Americans? Troops that were American GIs? No, I, c I can remember them sort of being about and aware that they were here. Uh, you interview somebody who's maybe uh, you know, three years earlier than me, they yes. would remember, remember it better. But I, I, I don't. I know they were about. I know they were down, uh, down at the Rinka, down at McGee. Uh, I'm sure if you ask the, the ladies, they would remember them better than the men. You know, Americans were always very fond of the ladies. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I personally can't remember much about the Americans. But I know at the, the, uh, the show we had down in the library there when they are doing the book, uh, some of the other contributors did mention quite a lot about the Americans, but uh, it just doesn't register with me. Right, thank you. Did any of your relatives go off to fight in either of the two wars? Ah, uh, yes, yes, th th they did. Uh, <coughs> on the Monteith side, uh, on my m my father's side, my father had two brothers and a sister. And one brother uh, went off to war, Robert, my uncle Robert. Uh, I, this has only uh, been brought back to me, I don't know this at all, but he went off to war and he got uh, awarded the Military Cross. Uh, but he in later life uh, decided to, to move to England and he lived in England all his life and his family were brought up so I never really got to know much about them. But that that was the only person in the Monteith side of the family that I can remember who, who went to war. That's the Second World War. <clears throat> Can't tell you about the First World War. I don't know what happened there. And you already talked about the incident being taken up to the Blair Hole. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't worry remember any of other incidents that occurred here during the war? No, n not, not, not vividly, and I know, I, I don't, I don't. Bear in mind I was only then going yeah. to be, I mean, depending what year you're on, seven, eight, nine year old, and it just hasn't really stuck. Right, well, very interesting. I'm curious to ask, pardon me, but was it very noisy, and could you hear explosions? 20 miles away. I, I do not recall hearing any explosions uh, from the bombing or what have you. But you could have somebody else sitting here, slightly different age to me, and I would say, oh yeah, we heard it all right. And mm -hmm. the bombing, the bombs going up, the bo booming of the, the, I suppose, the anti-aircraft guns and all that, that must have been very noisy. And it would have been heard in Whitehead. But personally, I can't tell you that I, I recall so that at all. Did you see just... Was it a glow of, of fires? Yeah. Or could you actually that, see? That's what, no, I, I just remember my recollection. I re what I saw and what to recollect are two different things, of course. Yeah. But what I re recollect has been up there with my dad and just seeing the, the place, a massive red, wow. you know, just the, that was one of the nights that the shipyard got hit badly. Mm -hmm. And the place was just a massive red. But I can't tell you that I saw measure Smith flying across or what have you. Mm. I, 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 I don't recall any of that. How long would you have stayed up there that night? I, mean, I would I would think not long. I would think I was only a very young lad and I'm sure my mum said to her husband, get that boy back here quick. <laughs> and your, your sister weren't taken up there? No, I don't think no. she was. She no. probably didn't, wouldn't Just have wanted to go, I would no. imagine. But uh, I can only recall him, him and I being, being there. Uh, and uh, uh, my re recollection is that it was a, a short short visit. And it would have been because, I mean, for all that anybody knew, okay, the, the planes were flying up the loch. Some people would tell you that they remember seeing planes come down. Fly. Well, I mean, it could have bombed Whitehead as easy as gone on up and dropped them at the, uh, mm. the harbour. So I'm sure uh, my father was told, get that young back, lad back here. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he was even told, don't take him at all. Mm. <laughs> for all we know. Mm. But I mean, I can remember people after I came back here told me, oh, we moved out of Belfast. We moved to Whitehead because we could actually stay here and away from the bombs and, and it was sheltered and we were not in any danger if we moved to Whitehead. Yes. Well, that would have, that would have been right. People would not have expected to be bombed in Whitehead. Whereas if you lived in Belfast, not only was there shipyards, but there was lots of manufacturing and all. 
and the Germans knew exactly what was going on where. Mm -hmm. But I could I reckon on their on their radar map I'd head didn't appear too much, you know, there was nothing but a couple of houses and a few shops. Uh, yeah, so Whitehead would have been looked upon as a safe haven. Whitehead was always a safe haven. It started as a quiet railway town when the railway's line was formed running up the law here. It was always a safe haven and has really remained so, mm -hmm. except for the some of the modern generation haven't made it just so safe. Mm -hmm. um, were there any special events that you particularly remember, like, I mean, Christmas and, you know, and that, that you remember from your childhood, like how did your family normally spend Christmas Day or was there any special decorations up at the time? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was the same only different for Christmas in, in my young day as it is now. We, we had, I'm trying to think, did we have a Christmas tree in Whitehead? I'm darned if I can remember there being a Christmas tree in Whitehead. But there was certainly a Christmas tree in number 58 Cable Road, all right. Because I always insisted that my dad get a tree that the top of it would hit the ceiling. <laughs> and being a good dad, he always did that. And he says, right, son, we'll cut the top off it. And I would cut the top off it. But uh, Christmas was, was a good celebration. Uh, there were some very good, good uh, sailing festiv festivities, festivities over the year that I remember. Uh, what year was it now? 1952? Was there some... Some great festivity. And every, every yacht club in the Belfast Loch. Sailing was a very big thing then in, in the loch. All down County Down, right up the County Adam side, there were lots of yacht clubs. And I'm trying to think the name of the festivity. It lasted a week. And every club had a regatta that day. Instead of having a regatta, each club would have had a regatta and alternate Saturdays through June, July and August. And this year... The naval company before we finished, they decided right to celebrate this. We we'll have we we'll get it every day in the week for six days, probably not the seventh day, six days. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a thing I remember uh, greatly. And I think somewhere in my attic, I still do have the uh, uh, program for the whole week's racing, which would have been, for example. Uh, Monday, uh, County Antrim Yacht Club, which is Whitehead's Yacht Club. Kind of. Number two, uh, Royal Belfast. Number three, Hollywood Yacht Club. Number four, Larne, wherever it might be. And the whole thing all in this lovely book. The festival. It was a festival. It was a festival of what? What was it? Doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, it was a fantastic book, and I think I still have that somewhere in the roof space. But I, I remember that as a... a a festivity you were asking me about. Yeah, that, that, that was really, really, really something. Uh, the, the 12th of July was always a very uh, a big thing too. Uh, uh, it, it's got out of hand now. It, it, it wasn't such a trouble, troublesome day uh, or time when I was a young fella. But that, that was always a, a great time. A lot going on. And... Uh, Everybody knew that uh, there were two weeks in July, which were called the Twelfth Fortnight. I don't know whether you've heard of it, the Twelfth Fortnight. People couldn't understand what you were talking about when you <laughs> talked about the Twelfth Fortnight. But uh, it was amazing, you know, in Northern Ireland, virtually everything, nearly everything, closed down. Now, that didn't mean that the train driver didn't drive his train and what have you, but a, a lot of things closed down where they could. The banks didn't close down, but, you know, it was really a real, real holiday period. And everybody really remembered the 12th fortnight <clears throat> because there was an awful lot going on. There'd be lots of festivities in the town. Time was very busy for young people then, you know. There was a lot going on. Right down at the, at the, at the recreation ground there, there was, there was a lot going on. There was the tennis, there was the bowls, the swimming. The, I mean, I spent half my life at the swimming pond between the swimming pond and the yacht club. Just one end of the promenade to the other. I do tell in the book there that... Uh, uh, thing I always remembered was I didn't have a watch and uh, I didn't know the time of the day but everybody knew that at 20 past 5 the Ardrossan boat as it was known there was an Ardrossan sailing from Belfast to Ardrossan doesn't go now I came down off the Whitehead about 20 past 5 so you knew mm -hmm. time to go home uh, I always, always remember that but Whitehead was a magnificent town for a young fella or girl to grow up in 
in those years. Magnificent time to grow up in. I think now when I look at what to do here and I think, oh dear, mm -hmm. oh dear. Now we're having a look at the book Whitehead, The Town With No Streets, written by Paddy P.J. O'Donnell, the, the local historian and author. But Paddy was an absolute wizard. An absolute wizard. The last time I had a long conversation with him was, I was walking, I don't know what it was, but it was up at the top of Victoria Avenue, right at the very top, and I was coming down, and I stood looking at the chapel with the scaffolding up. Yeah. And Paddy was a great chapel man, great church man. I says, Paddy, what the hell is doing with all that scaffolding up there? Sorry I asked the question because it must have taken him an hour to answer it. You know, <laughs> you know Paddy was going, oh, yes. I told him, I told him, he should have done that, he should have done that. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, oh, when I got away, I thought, oh, I'm glad to get rid of him. And then I picked myself, Dad, he's dead oh, and gone. Oh, he was dear. fabulous. He loved to talk. Oh, Opinionated, yeah. To talk. I'll never forget, I asked him about Diamond Jubilee Wood. And he hated the place because he wanted the golf course to be twice as big, mm -hmm. and the other golf course was too windy for him. Mm. And I'm, I'm like, oh dear, wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, right now, your partner played golf and they're watching you walking along there. I went, he, in, oh, yeah, I went in to have two books signed and thought I'd be out again in ten minutes. No. And I had to promise him I would be back. Yeah, always back. But when you mention Paddy and golf, I'll tell you this about in those days. In Whitehead, and anywhere in Whitehead, there was a wee bit of a class distinction. Right. And Whitehead was no different from anywhere else. Yes. And they're what you would call the the rich people in Whitehead, the not so rich but the not poor people, and then there was ones which you would call the blue collared workers in Whitehead. Right. Yes. And Paddy came from the bottom family, a good hard working family. Yes. Oh, I know. But in those days, the postman and yeah, things. in those yeah. days, those sort of people didn't play golf. No. Oh, no, golf was more for the more upper class people. Not only right hand anywhere, mm. but right. Paddy wasn't a member of the golf club. But Paddy was a great talker, and he, he knew lots of his friends were moving up the social strata a wee bit more. And I can remember them getting Paddy up to the golf club, and. Um, Showing Paddy what the golf club was like and what have you, and he says, Can I have a ball? and put it to you up, and Paddy had a ball and mm -hmm. really went out of sight. Mm -hmm. And I realised that as Paddy had done, they might have just been the same class as them, and mm -hmm. he rented motor cars and this sort of thing. You know, he wasn't going to work in the bank or an accountant or a dentist. He was a whatever. mechanic. He, yeah, he was a working class man. But in those days, there was a wee bit of a line drawn there. Doesn't mm. mean you couldn't cross over the line and you're dead. Yeah. But, you know, that talks about, uh, tells a lot about Dr. Dawson. He was a very good friend, and I can always remember, oh, I'm playing with Paddy. Yeah. Playing with Paddy. Yeah. There was no difference for Jell. If you were a good no. human being, you were as no, good that, as anybody. That, that, that would be right. Yeah. But when you mentioned Paddy and golf, that, that's right. And, and he, he became, I'm sure he's passed captain of the club. He played for a long, long time. Oh, yeah, he's up there with his photo. Yeah. I'm you never sure. go up there. Very seldom, but I've been up in that mess. I've been up for a long time. Did you know Ted Wilson? Oh, I mean, he's still alive. Oh, I. Uh -huh. Now, there was, would be a wee bit, I mean, Jell played with him, and you know the two of them flew around um, all those golf courses oh. from early morning oh, and yeah. got in the book oh, of Guinness Book of Records. So you were about right. to tell us, okay. you, were, you were the bank manager. I and was, I, that's what I ended up here, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, but when I was a young fellow living in Whitehead, of course, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I hadn't a clue what I was going to do, just like anybody. But uh, I went down to Masonic School, and uh, I, uh, when I finished there and finished my exams, uh, I think the first thing my mother really needed was somebody coming into the house to bring home a few pound notes at the end of the month. And both my sister and I went for straight from school in, into the bank. As you had to do in those days, you, 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 if you were going into the bank, you had to be in before, I think, something like your 18th birthday. And if you missed that, you were too old to go into the bank. That was Why? I don't, don't ask me. That was it. That's the way the bank worked. What? So you had to, so I, I, both my sister and I went into the bank. Uh, I travelled every day from Whitehead, to the start of my career anyway, up to Belfast, because I was based in Belfast. But what I'm saying is, it seems strange to me that uh, as a young fellow in Whitehead, I would be in here and maybe throwing stones at the bank window or whatever I was doing or 
you know, messing up their garden or what have you. There were two banks. There was the, the no, Northern you, you Bank. You threw stones at the bank's window and uh, ended up they gave you a job. Did they did, not yes. recognise no, you? No, no, they didn't. No, no, I had a scarf friend the head. They wouldn't have recognised me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> he is. <laughs> Oh, you didn't throw stones at the bank. Probably well, stones. I was I, I was like any anybody any devilment, you know. I, I wasn't uh, we didn't do graffiti in those days, but anyway, I looked upon myself as a bit of a carry on fella. And I I I find it strange in later life to think that having done all that, I then ended up as the manager of the bank. Uh, I was in the bank all my life. I went straight from school, came up from Dublin for school. Uh, went to college for a number of months after the summer holidays to do get the old brain ticking over, then sat the bank exam, which I didn't pass the first time, which floored me because I'd left them I'd left my boarding school and told them, right, I'm away, I'm off to work. I'm not be seeing you all again. <laughs> I failed the exam and had to go back oh. to another year of boarding school. But anyway, I did the exam the second time and got into the bank. So I went into the bank in nineteen uh, uh, fifty two. And, uh, served in numerous branches, but there was a progression like in any business. You, you work your way up, and I started off and became not the different titles from pro manager, sub manager, all sorts of things. But anyway, my last post was to Whitehead, and I can remember I was up in the Belfast, uh, up at the bank, up on uh, Atlantic Avenue, uh, uh, up on Hampton Road in Belfast. I was. Assistant manager, which in those days was was a senior senior posting in a big office, and that was a big office. So I was happy to stay there as long as I wanted, except that uh, Antrim Road, Atlantic Avenue, was Tiger Country. We were in the middle of the troubles, and uh, I had a, a, quite an experience up there with the troubles yeah. in the bank. But anyway, I remember they uh, getting a phone call at my desk one day from the personnel director. Uh, who in those days the bank was great, he knew everybody by name. He says, Right, Trevor, I've got a job for you. I said, Okay, I'm dead on up here. He says, I've got a job for you. Yes. And he says, uh, What about going to Whitehead as manager? And I said, You're kidding. <laughs> and he says, No. I said, Sure, you know where I came Because I knew all about it. I said, You know where I came from? I said, I grew up in the town, I spent yeah. all my life there. Are you sending me back there as manager? And he says, I've offered you that post as manager. He says, if you want it, you can have it. If you don't, we'll set the phone down and I'll ring somebody else. He was being polite but joking. Yes. He says, but I'll give you, give you a, a 24 hours to think about it. So me and my wife thought about it and I thought, there's no way I can refuse it, you know. But so, you were reluctant? Why? Uh, I wasn't just too sure. In those days, you didn't go back to the town where you knew people. Oh, I see. And that didn't work in the bank. Yes, they're Even bringing to in their money. Yeah, to, yeah, to explain that, if I, I lived in Whitehead and I got, went to work in the train in the morning and I could get on the train and somebody getting off the train was coming down from head office to do relief work in Whitehead yes. for the week. Right. And I would say to myself, well, why don't we get me to do it instead of paying him his fare down and what have you? But they wouldn't have, and it was the policy... You did not work in the same town that you were brought up in. Yes. And you did not work in an office with it, one of your relatives. But all these changed because, mm. again, another part of the story is I was working in Larnbratch at one time and I was opening up the mail for the manager. His office was at one end of the bank. And he says, oh, he says, Trevor, he says, guess who's joining our staff? I says, who is it, manager? He's getting a letter from me. He says, it's your sister. I says, oh, and I thought, my sister. And then he says, oh, oh there's another letter here. He says, oh. I was getting the book. They never kept the two, so I went to Ballyclare, and she came there. But this has gone back to the Whitehead one. You did. You never really worked in your own time, and that's what I said to the personnel manager. I said, you're sending me back to the time where I know everybody. I'm not going to say I know everybody who's their bank accounts there. I've never been away. You know, 20 years I was away. Yes. I left Whitehead uh, in 1960 and didn't come back till 1982. That's 22 years, I think. Uh, uh, so I said, it'll have changed. He says, our policy's changed. If you like that job, it's yours. Mm. So I took the job. So I came back here as a branch manager. 
and uh, served there for seven, eight years until I, I retired. Just I just retired from there. So I was the last, what people call here, I don't mean this personally to me, but a real bank manager. Hmm. They, they, don't, they don't exist now. You can't go into the bank and talk to your bank manager because yes. they're not there. They don't have them. But in my day, I was there. I was the bank manager and they came into me whether they wanted £10, they wanted £10,000 or £100,000. They came and they talked to me yes. or whoever was the manager. But that's all changed. So after, not long after I retired, thank goodness I got out of a good time. Things at the banks changed a lot. And I've noticed that uh, were you living in the bank building or did yeah. you all just work in the 1970s no, extension? No, I, I, worked, I worked in the house. I lived in the house. Right. Not every bank had a bank house yes. attached. Most of them didn't. Mm. But Whitehead had a house attached to it. And one of the things was, uh, if you took the job, you, took, you had to live in the house. Because oh, I yeah. said to the personnel manager, I said, I had just bought a lovely house up on Upper Green Island Road. Wow. Okay. And I looked out the, our window and I looked up to the, the, the Belfast Harbour. And I looked down left to the end of the Belfast Lock, to the Ladens and what have you. The panoramic view, just nothing in front of me. Great big field, but no building on it. And I was coming down to the bank house here, which does not have much of a view. And he says, if you want the job, you take the house. You can't, you, it goes with it. Well, so I had to think it over. But, uh, but I took the job. The job had to go. Now I understand. You had to have 24 hours just to ask your family, Yeah. Uh -huh. do you want to move to Whitehead yeah. with me? Well, we didn't do that time because, of course, I'd, I, I had lived my life here. But as a family, we hadn't. Hmm. Uh, uh, and my wife and kids knew Whitehead all right. But I remember very well that very night, uh, she was away on holiday. We had a wee cottage down in County Down. And she was away with the kids on holiday. And I rang her up. I said... You better get back home, we'll get some talking to do tonight. Oh boy. So we came down and we drove down to Whitehead and we parked the car and that was it. I didn't have to look at the bank, I knew the bank had mm. grown up here and I says, that's it there. So she looked at it and I mean, you probably have never been in the bank house, you will be when uh, Sinead gets it all opened up. Yes. But I mean, it's massive. massive. I've seen it. Yeah, the I've ceilings go up, they yeah. go up. And Patricia says, I haven't got one cart that'll fit this house. I have one carpet that'll fit this house. You know, she says, well, what am I going to do? So uh, I said, well, we'll talk that over with them. I, th I think they're the very oh, understanding. It so that, that was included in No, yourself? it would not have been furnished at all. Oh, I thought the previous bank manager would have been living there. And no. Well, if he had, he wasn't. But if he, he wasn't because his wife refused to come. He came from Limavada. Oh, it was vacant. And he commuted. He, well, he, he, he was he was in Limavada as manager, and yeah. they closed down some. You know the way they're closing down branches in various towns. The, yes. the are now. Well, they were doing it then, and his branch got closed down, and he was offered. We didn't take his managership away from him. Said you're okay, we're going to give you a white head branch. The manager there was retiring. Yes. So he reluctantly took the job because he wanted to keep his managerial position, but his wife says. No way, I'm not going to Whitehead. Yeah. So she stayed in Lima Valley all week huh. and he lived in a, in a house on his own. I don't know what, he must have had a bed and mm -hmm. what have you, uh, and a kitchen. Uh, I think that I think that the, the Whitehead people were very kind to him. Uh, I think he went to our church and uh, I think they're very kind to him there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the answer to that is he didn't really have much in the house. So, yes. uh, but if you had, it was, you know, it was it would have been his personal stuff. He'd have taken it with him anyway. Mm. But so I talked to him. I was about it personally. He says, OK, everything you need. Uh, uh, we had got the whole kitchen. You know, I, we had got the whole kitchen, put in a whole new kitchen. You, you pick the kitchen, we'll put it in. Uh, as regards furnishings, uh, uh, I know you have the curtain that'll fit any of those windows. Uh, you buy them, we'll pay half of it, you pay half of them, right. and as and when you move out of that house, they're yours, okay? Right. You know, that, that was not knowing when that would be. So that's the way that worked. Yes, please. I'm yeah, talking about what you didn't there think. are very tall, yeah. Oh, massive. But it was a fantastic house, fantastic house. I mean, once she gets that all done, it'll be lovely. Well, Some lovely fireplaces there oh, still. Oh, beautiful. 
Beautiful, beautiful rooms. The rooms went on and went on and the rooms went up and went up. But the state it is in at the moment, it's appalling. Absolutely. Big holes in the floor and... Yeah. Did you just take two or three rooms and live in it or did you actually furnish everything? No, no, we didn't furnish furnish them all. Some of the one rooms at the top we didn't bother at all. Yeah. Until some of my, one of my daughters fancied one of the rooms up there. So wow. we got the painters in and he painted yes. it and got it all decked up for us. But by and large... Uh, all the bedrooms were on the first landing. You came up and, and all the bedrooms were there. Yeah. Uh, it was lovely. But uh, Sinead took me in quite some time ago. And uh, she said, you've got to get a bit of a shock here. This is before it was even tidied up. Yes. I walked into the kitchen and looked up. <laughs> and my youngest girl's bedroom was above the kitchen. But when I looked up, there was nothing. Mm. The whole floor had gone. There was a whole floor missing. Yes. The, whole, the whole place went to pieces. Yes, I to pieces. you could see through the but rafters. That, that was strange for me, this is what I, I, I'm really telling you about, to come back here uh, as a manager and have so many customers mm. that I knew personally. And if I didn't know them personally, I knew their grandfather or their great-grandfather, depending on the age of these people. Because yes. I had lived here all my life, yes. for 20 years. Mm. I left in 1962, 60, and I got married in 62, and I was in various branches and various managerial positions, but in 1982... I came back here, and I was always coming back to Whitehead. That's where I was going to retire to. If I'd been manager in Bambridge, should we say, and yes. retired, I would have been coming back to buy a house in Whitehead. So they did me a good turn, really, in that I was back in Whitehead when yes. I retired. So all I had to do was close the bank door behind me and buy a property in Whitehead. Oh, and you were able to do that? I was able to do that. It took me a year. Yes. But the strange thing was, they didn't rush me out, because oh, that's good. I was I was keeping the place livable, shall we say? Yes. I was living in the bank house, but I wasn't coming through the adjoining door into the bank because I was no longer working in the bank. But I, I lived in the property. Yes. So I I lived lived there and for a year and I lived in various houses and bungalows, but I just didn't get the place I wanted in Whitehead, and they just said, "You take your time. When you yes. get the one you want, tell us and." We'll call it a day. Uh -huh. But living in the bank house had its advantages and disadvantages. I had this lovely house up on Upper Green Island Road, yes. which I hadn't long bought. So I had to sell it. So I sold it and got X pounds in my yes. hand. But those X pounds weren't going into more property because the property I was getting down here wasn't mine. I was only looking after it for That's this money. Yes. So I had to invest that money. So I invested my money. Mm. But at that time, man, uh, it'll be hard to remember this, but at that time, that turned out to be good. Oh. But my, my, my interest in my investments was good. Hmm. So that when I came to need to buy a bungalow, I had to sell investments, but I had gained quite a bit on the market yes. over that period. So it worked, it worked out well. So I then, when I left, closed the door behind me here, I bought the bungalow up in Princess Park. Would you know the year that you arrived as the bank manager here or, or the year that you retired from being the bank manager here? Yes, I, I came here in 1992. I have to think of a right now, 1992. That's what you said before you. Right, and I retired about 1999, I think. Right. That's right, 99. Yeah, then we came on the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that, that's right. I had about seven years here as manager. Give or take a wee bit, I can't remember the exact months. Yes. But uh, I, I can always remember it strange coming back to Whitehead and interviewing people that I knew them. And a lot of people welcomed me with open arms. Yes. There were one or two businesses didn't welcome me with open arms because, you see, I was seeing how they were doing, mm. which was, you know, a bit strange for them. Yes. I knew this fellow when he grew up in the town. I used to kick football with him. Mm. Now he knows I'm in diffs with the bank, you know, but that was all very personal. I didn't disclose anybody's business all into the customer. Yes. That was one thing in the bank. He didn't do that sort of thing. But uh, I, I thought that might be awkward, but the bank said, no, you go down, you cope with it. You let us know if you've got a problem. Well, I didn't really have a problem. I had one customer who was kicking up, but... Mm, didn't matter good. what I was going to kick up. I wasn't going anywhere. Yes. So. Did you play it. any sports when you were young? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I did. I played golf up in the golf, golf course here. I played golf there. I was never a great golfer. I was what you would call people would call a weekend golfer. I, I wasn't a great man for competitions or anything like that. 
but I enjoyed it. And then I took what a lot of golfers did. I took a, a very bad back, uh, which came from a, 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 a rugby injury, uh, and niggled on and niggled on until I was playing golf and dragging myself around to play golf to be seen to be playing golf. Mm -hmm. And I said to hell with that, mm -hmm. and I gave it up. Uh, yeah, but uh, golf was golf was pretty in interest, and and, and the boats, uh, lived down at the boats, mm -hmm. lived the boats. Mm -hmm. So, that, so was, that was most significant to you to have beyond the sea. I yeah, think. that yeah sea was sea was a very yeah. big thing. It was in my father's blood, it was in my blood, and uh, I never managed to own a very big yacht of my own, but uh, I did have mm -hmm. and I did have a boat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you recall how local people spent their holidays when you were a child? Yeah, well, the, 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 I, not in great detail, honey, except that there weren't too many uh, going to Mallorca uh, or, or Norway or even Denmark, you know, if we could find out on the map where Denmark was. Sorry, sorry, honey. <laughs> Did you no. have the opportunity to visit any foreign countries like Denmark when you were young? <laughs> No, I was advised by the local agent not to go near Denmark. <laughs> I asked for that, didn't I? Uh, no, there were very few people who travelled uh, abroad, and I would say most of that would have been businessmen. And if it wasn't businessmen, it would have been like uh, our next-door neighbours at one time who were big business people themselves with a great big business, and they may have gone off to some exotic place. But exotic travel was not the, ding, the dumb thing in those days. It wasn't really. There were cruises, mind you. The, the cruises are very run-of-the-mill now. But you did have cruises in those days, but they again were for the well-to-do people. So that cut me out immediately. Were you and your family attending church when you were young? Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, you wouldn't know the church, it's the Whitehead Presbyterian Church in King's Road. I'll show it to you sometime when you're out about the town. I went there as a wee fella, I used to sit on the, up on the back row, the back seat in the gallery, uh, until uh, my father and mother made me come down and we sat uh, on the side that you're on now, which is the good side, only about four rows from the front. But do you ever look on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, the pews and see the little brass plaque inside each pew? When you're sitting in a pew and you mm -hmm. live in front of you, mm -hmm. well, on that little plaque was typed the name of your family, if you had a pew, and my teeth was clearly on that little card, and oh. I would walk up, and if I forgot which pew I was going into, I'll have to keep looking for the name, and there was your name on the pew. You talk to some of the older folk, Jack Crooks, or any of those ones, uh, and they'll say, yeah, that's right. Didn't mean you had to stick to it, but I mean, we, we had a pew that was known as our pew. Mm -hmm. And that's the church I was brought up in, and I always tell the, the story, and I've told Ian Carton many the time, that I got a right thrashing when I came home from church one night because it had been Children's Sunday, and I sat up at the, uh, with the choir set on my wicker work seat, and uh, I needed to go to the loo, but I didn't go to the loo except I just wet myself on the seat, <laughs> and the seat knew, told everybody that I'd wet myself. Oh, that's not so your fault. When I got mm -hmm. home, there was a strap out. Oh. Well, oh, I can, I can remember it well, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it what age it? would you have been? Uh, I was probably, I would say, <laughs> five, five, six, maybe. Oh, you know, but uh, oh, I, yeah, I went to school. I went to Sunday school. My sister taught in the Sunday school. Uh, I was, I was a good church goer. Uh, then I dropped off Whitehead Church when I went to school in Dublin because I went to church mm -hmm. in Dublin. Uh, and when I came back here again, uh, I wasn't. Uh, uh, back at Whitehead for a while, so Whitehead and me weren't together for 20 odd years. I was born up Jordanstown, Green Island, was where I lived, Belfast, Garden, Belfast, the uh, Garden Village outside Whitehead on the Shore Road there. Uh, I, I lived there in a rented flat for a while. So, Were churches generally well attended? In oh, yes. Oh, no, big big time. No churches were very well attended. Better yeah. than nowadays, maybe. Oh, oh yes. I would say I would say better. It's hard for me as a young fella to remember, but I would have thought yes, better than better than they are now. More going on as well. More going on. Sunday school and outings and things like that. I suppose you would have walked to church here. Oh yeah, I just walked down the road and 
I would have lay, it's strange to think about it now, I might have, if I got away with it, I'd been lying on the bed until the church bell started to ring, you know, and you jump in and put your clothes on. Now, last Sunday, I was standing ringing the bell, you know, so the only thing's moved on a bit. I'm now ringing the bell for somebody else to say, oh, better get down to church. Oh, I just went down the road to church, yeah. Did you belong to any of the church organisations? Yeah, well, I, I was, uh, because of the... the because of my seven years away in, at Dublin in school, a lot of stuff I missed out on at home. Because when I came home, it was holiday time, Easter time, summer time, and you know the organisations probably weren't meeting then. But I, I was in the clubs and the scouts. I wasn't in the BB. Uh, I was that, that that's the ones I was in. Yeah, the, the, I played I played uh, table tennis for one of the church teams. I actually played for Temple Coral table tennis team which is uh, the Church of Ireland. And uh, I have a photograph in my possession at the moment. No, I haven't. I've given it away. Uh, which is a, f a photograph of one of the captains there at Temple Coron, table tennis. And, and there's a few people in it that uh, are still alive and kicking. So I took it down to church and uh, I passed it around. And uh, it's now back with somebody else who has more right to have the photograph than me. But I'm in the back row of it because I was playing for Temple Coron. Yeah, table tennis was a, a big thing in those days. Uh, um, the bowls, but it was it was outdoor bowls in those days. I don't recall that there was much indoor bowls. I could be totally wrong, but the outdoor bowls was always very big in Whitehead. Yeah, it's in the book, in Paddy's book. Yeah, it would be. Very big. They always had a good team. And I'll tell you what has completely changed in the church, and that's the choir. When I was a young fellow at the choir in Whitehead, uh, both sides of the, the organ were choir, both sides. I could nearly go around and tell you who sat where, mm -hmm. both sides. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a, an approximate choir of maybe 30, 30, 40 people. And why do you think that is? I, don't, I don't know that, can't, I can't see that. I mean, maybe less people go to church when they start. Yeah, if you don't go to yeah. church, you're not going to be in the choir. No, no. Uh, but the choir was a good choir. Uh, and they ha were in all sorts of competitions through the year. Uh, uh, they had a, a very famous organist, organist called Brown. Brown, what was his name? I've forgotten his Christian name now. Don't say I could forget it because I knew him so well. But they won many of competition, uh, the Whitehead Choir. There's photographs of them, I think, maybe up in the Dr. Stewart room. But they, the church, church was, was a big thing then. Thing. Yeah. Um, did um, do you we're going on to folklore now? Do you recall any local myth or legends that have been passed down over the generations? Le legends. legends, legends, legends. It's legends in Denmark, but it's legends in Ireland. I remember the Romans. Yes. Ah, uh, no, I can't can't put my head around that one. I mean, what that would be. Can you give us any examples of interesting local characters? Oh, yes. Handfuls of them. Handfuls of what them. about Mrs. Turtle? Yes. Francis. Well known in our church, but it seems strange now when you go into our church and 95% uh, wouldn't have a clue who Francis Turtle was, but she d donated so much money to the church and was so, so giving. Uh, always dressed in blue, always dressed in blue, very well presented lady, lady muck as they would call them now, you know, mm -hmm. was Frances Turley, yes, she was, she was a character or a characteress, if that's a female character, mm -hmm. but they're all over the town, like any town ha ha has them, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, did, I did two programmes for this down at, at Genesis, you yes. were involved with those, were you involved with those? I'm way too old to be in a youth club. I'm no, 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 recently. Yeah. They, they, they did recordings down in Genesis. Right. They, got, they got four of us down, four oldies, down, and we, recount, we recounted like I'm doing to you now. You're very generous with your time, my goodness. Yeah, and, but, but various things happened. The uh, first recording was done and dusted, and uh, a pink sign equipment or something didn't work, so we never got any result. Oh. The next one went down, it did. Uh, I think they had a break in. And stuff was stolen, so nothing ever came of it. Well, I swear this is still here and it's yeah. running, and we can even play it to you right. for a minute or two just but to prove it. <laughs> we, 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 four of us talked down there. Uh, Sandy McGregor, 
He's dead oh, yeah. and gone now. Yeah. Sandy McGregor. Uh, uh, Margaret Chambers. You know Margaret mm -hmm. Chambers? Mm -hmm. uh, myself, I shouldn't be putting myself next, and Mrs. Frackleton Sr. Mm -hmm. The four of us were down there as four old fogies, mm -hmm. chatting away, and we, we recollected about an awful lot of white head. What was that last question you asked me, which maybe prompted uh, the me? Log, the, any exams that are interesting in local no, Yeah, right. Well, we, we, we ran them off there. There were powerful characters. All you had to do particularly was go around the shops and think who owned the shops and the sort of characters. There were some, some real powerful characters. I mean, uh, not many people would would, rem would remember them now, but, uh, oh yeah, we had. Yeah. Have you anybody else you mentioned, Mrs? I wouldn't have put Frances Turtle as a character. She was really... She was That's really the only one I remember she from was 63, 64. Oh, walking right. every day in a purple coat and her hat. Oh, uh, and nobody spoke to her. She just walked there yeah. and you just didn't speak to her. No. I didn't. We, we had characters die at our church now. The, the church had characters too, you know. Church had characters. I'm just amused that you're, you're now the bell ringer. No, no. And, uh, I, I, oh. Yes, yes, I bell ringer when it's my turn. Oh, you take yeah. turns ringing the bells in well, the church. Well, well, what you do is you, you, there's various jobs to be done in any church. Right. Well, one of them is opening the church and closing the church after yes. service. So if you if you're willing and put your name forward to do the job, you can. So I'm on that list. So maybe one what maybe one week in ten or so is yes. my week, and and I go down and I'm okay. like holding a rope or pressing. Oh yeah, oh, right. oh it's, it's just one bell. Right. And it's just one, one bell, you just put it down. I'm just seeing a thread here because you used to be a mischievous character doing bad things to the garden of the bank and you end up as the bank manager. I then know. you're the kid lying in bed waiting for the church bells and now you have to get up early and ring it I have to. Now I have to ring it, yes, I do. I, have to. I always stop about so five minutes before the time to let that poor kid get out of bed and get down before people the minister talk about gets karma and it's all catching up with you. You're having to, <laughs> dear Lord. <laughs> what a wonderful life you've had, Trevor. <laughs> Must be joking. Are we very run of the mill? Yeah, no, I just we should because say I want to ask you something. But no, not we'll say for this. thank you at the end of the tape. Yes, honey. yes. It's said in the manual. Trevor, the manual. this has been like being taken to such a wonderful, just the kind of world I like, the kind of world that I wish was still here, because I'm that old, you know, not as old as you, but almost yeah. there. And I just, I think the olden days was good. Whitehead, 1963-64. Yeah. That's just lovely. Uh, re re really good. I can thank you very much indeed for, for giving us of your time. And, uh, Not at all. And uh, thank you. It could be endless. You, you flicking through that book now. When I um, flick through that book and stop and look at a page, I might have to take me ten minutes to get away from the page. Yeah. Well, well, can I? Can you I'm turn a, this off? I'm very tempted. I mean, that's mm -hmm. 1955, and Paddy O'Donnell obviously doesn't know who any of them are, but hey, someone where? like you might, because oh, right. oh. there's no caption there whatsoever. Oh, yeah. The tape is still running, oh, Henry, by yes. the way. Yes. Uh, yeah, that, are they? Uh, get us. This uh, is page Walter, Walter, Walter Geddes. 295. I'm fairly, fairly sure that was uh, is one of the Geddes family. I'm not going to be so too... Second from really. left in a hat is, is a Mr. Gettys. Yes, yeah. Uh, second from the right is Bill Lav. Bill His Lav. name was William Laverty, Laverty. But he was known as Bill Lav. Yes. Um, uh, that man, uh, that man, that man, that man, I know, but they're gone. I can't, I, I can't, yes. I can't get, get them. But, uh, 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 yeah... I, no, I can't. I, sh I should know him. There is but, but a Campbell who's sailing too, Mr. Campbell. Here. Yeah. Oh, well, that's going back a bit. That's going back to 31 now. Oh, right. you, you would be pushing me there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, a lot of these photographs, yes, I do, I do know them. I think my uncle's in one of them now, in one of the pages where there's the Whitehead councillors. Right. My uncle, uncle Neil, that is John McTill's mm -hmm. father, is, is in that. Yeah. Uh, you see, those, those, are, those are too early for me, but I mean... Oh, well, I'm going to go home and scribble those names in in my copy, because this yeah. is, uh, this oh, is uh, gold dust. What, 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 what is it? No. There's oh. one where they are sitting, some three, four guys are sitting in front of... It's a sailing event called a regatta. A regatta. Is uh, that that's, that's, that's nothing to Whitehead. That's a sailing regatta. Oh. It's uh, organised sailing races. Yes. Uh, you know. Uh, that's oh, a real estate man. A standing back alone. Stanley. Can you can you point out to me here Crawford Campbell or Gordon? 
Uh, I doubt it. Did you know them? Yes. They lived across the road from me. Yeah. Down the road a wee bit, the red brick house was on the floor. I side. was Crawford's girlfriend. Were you really? Right. And I lived to tell the tale. Yes, I've And Crawford is dead 25 that's years that's in a, a fortnight. That's a good way of putting it. Yes. That, so, I, I, page 287, and that's Mr. Macaloni. Oh, oh well, there, there's quite a few there. That's the Reverend Stewart. That's, oh. the, that's, the, that's the local minister. Front row, second from left, is Reverend Stewart. Is he still Stewart. alive? Oh, no, no, he's dead and gone. Uh, 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 Jackie Crooks. Jackie Crooks is third oh. from left in the front row of the yeah. Boys' Brigade. John Chambers. John Chambers is fifth Marcus. from left. Oh. Yes. And page two. Leach Kyle. Leach Kyle is then the front row seated on the right hand side. Right. Kyle right. has passed on. Chambers has passed on. Uh, who, who did I tell you that was? That, what was it? I think I got wrong. I told you that was Jackie. Jackie. That's Gilbert Martin. Oh, Gilbert, Gilbert Martin. Martin. Be Betty Martin uh, died recently, who yeah. was his widow. Yeah, right. Yes. Dr. Martin's family. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Gilbert Martin is beside the, the minister. Yes, that, that, that is that quite photo. correct. Uh, I, I'll try here. Uh, uh, that's Bertie Burns is behind Gilbert Martin. Right, so second Jack row. Cripps, Jackie Cripps is behind the centre man in the middle row. Yeah. There, Hildage, Davy Hildage. Oh, he's, he's behind one of my neighbours. Uh, well, that that'll be that'll be Davy or commonly known as Dagger. My I goodness! Think. Uh, behind John Chambers. Wow, I wonder does he know about this? Uh, oh dear, you know you, you know the face and you just can't get the name to it. I have to pass by. Uh, and I know that one too. Oh dear, give him time and we get these. You know that was Stanley Macaroni. Mm. I know all the faces you see, but. But you were at the Scouts and not the Boys Brigade. Yeah, I wasn't in the Boys Brigade. So how do you know these people? Oh, well, they all, they all, I grew up. Well, I mean, the time was small, you mm. see. The time was small. Yes. We all played together. Mm. Wow. Uh, give, give them more time with this book. If you wanted, I could give you a lot of names. Mm. I'm, quite, I'm quite sure I could. I 1934. Been, yeah. That was just a year before I was born. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well. Oh, my mother's in this book. Is she? Yeah. Oh. oh. Could yeah. you show us? Yeah. Which book is she in? Oh. No, I know Howard Gaston. Oh. You know Howard Gaston? Yeah, he was in that Boy Scout picture right. there. Page 283. Yeah. Which one is Mum? On the left. Yeah, the lady, the taller, taller lady on the left. Oh, That's lovely. my mother. That's her mum. Yeah. She was the one. Kathleen Fleming. Yes. Kathleen Fleming. Mm. You heard the name earlier on today. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. What a thing. Uh, and that, that is Maud Watt. That was a good friend of my, my mother's, Maud Watts. They were another good Whitehead family. Uh, oh, th th this book of Paddy's, you know, it's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. It's unbelievable. It's good we have it. That, that, that he, that well, he left us behind. Can I take right. an action photo while you're going through the you book? You can take an action photograph. I'll, honey, I won't attack you. Don't worry, dear. Honey, no, I don't want to be in the photo. Look, look slightly now, more. There, there's, no. the cub, there's the cub pack, you see, in 1928, but that's before me. But that's that was me with my woggle and all on, you know. Were you? That's what you call No, this is 1928 now. Oh, right, right, you weren't going. But that, that would be the same Whitehead cub pack, I would think. Gosh. Yes, first Whitehead cub pack. Well, that's the one I joined mm. a number of years after that photograph. Gosh, it's such marvellous history. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, my, my when I when I saw these bricks of paddies, you know, I went down. And to and, and you see Doctor Wilson there as a young person. Oh, I think Doctor John. Doctor John, somewhere yeah, there's some John's ambulance. Uh, he would probably be in that, wouldn't he? He is in one of them because he's got the same stature as he has now. 1972. See, given given time, given time, I I could name most of these people, but even the ones I couldn't get, you know, I could get people to name them. Oh gosh, we're getting up to modern times now. Mm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's just just that the people uh, are, are interesting. Sorry, I'm taking up more of your time there. Look! Oh, look. I will sit here all You're day. welcome to spend the yeah. night. <laughs> this is so interesting. <laughs> Trevor, I'm I really... knew that was coming, that's why I brought my pyjamas. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's friendly, look at that there. Is that, that, What's that, that? That's amazing. That, that's just the people down at Victoria Square, the railway yeah. station. Friendly, yeah. that's the fish and chip Do shop now. Yeah, and that's, well, it's the butcher. There was either Heverons. Do you know what no, we No, no, that's not, that's, that no. was never Heverons. That was Finlay's. No, Finlay's. Do you know who we're interviewing? Who? Coming back from Canada here in April. 
he ruined the butcher who went to Canada. Well, married, was, married somebody. All the Haverns and all the families in Whitehead, Haverns, Wallen, and all, and all. Look, was that when I was a kid, there was Billy the Haven, butcher. Haven, Haven, Billy, Haven, Billy, 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 that would be Billy McDowell. Billy McDowell. Oh, okay. Billy McDowell. Yeah. Yeah. Was Mr. and Mrs. Friendly's helper, right? Yeah, yeah. a trainee butcher. Yeah, right. Mr. and Mrs. Friendly died and passed on. Right, and Billy bought the shop. Yeah. Ah, I and see. Billy McDowell was at our church every Sunday for years and years and what? years. And when I was ringing the bell, Billy and the wife would come up around, you know, because yes. they sat up in the gallery. That's the Billy you're talking about. Right. I oh, I. Yeah, because I was he, a kid, but uh, he died. He died not 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 so Sam long. Haveron, we are interviewing Sam. Sam Haveron. Yeah. No one well. Yeah. Sam and coming Donard. Over. Donard. He's coming Sammy, over. Donard. Yeah. And Harry. Yeah. And uh, the one at the top of the cable was Bernard. Yeah. But the, 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 you, the, the, you know the, Anne, the daughter of Sam, she right. owns the Fresh Beautician. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh. You can go and have a facelift then. I could do with one. Ah, uh, mm, that must be a girl thing. Right, mm. that's that's John. Right, that's John's father. Yeah, that one there is John's father yeah. with a white shirt. Gosh, so yes. page right. two four four is my uncle, my father's brother, that is Mister Neil Monteith, second from the right. Yes. Uh, I would, I would, not, not much as me going through the rest of them. Uh, I'll have a look at a, a film just. Uh, Colwells, there were hundreds of Colwells that were doctors. I remember mm. Dr. Colwell. Mr. Yes. Simpson, his son, appears as a, an economist on your TV nearly every night. Uh, Moat was the, the postmaster in Whitehead. W.J. Russell was the shopkeeper in the corner where the old tea shop is down King's Road. Mm. That was what, that mm. was Russell's shop. Mm. Uh, the town clerk, Mr. Stevenson. Oh. Mr. Mr. Gervin had a, an electric shop uh, down beside... Uh, what was the police station, which is now a private house, I think. Was that Vera Gervin's father? No, no, no. a different Gervin. The Russell shop, was it uh, like a greengrocer's? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, then it became Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Wilson was running it up to a number of years ago. Uh, then he sold it on, and it's now that tea house. I remember it as a, as a mace when I was a child. Mace was the, right. the chain it was part of, mm. and some of the tiny, right. it was blue and white paint. Yeah. Um, but I and then it was a funeral parlour. No, no. It was threatened to be a funeral parlour. Oh right. Till Grace. Grace Goodward would be a funeral parlour opposite to her house, <laughs> and she got a petition going. Oh, I, I think it was for a year or two. Did it actually it have folded? Because in the kitchens they showed me a ramp where where coffins would go, and stay over there. That. Well, um, I never knew that it got that far. I think it was, and I was amazed it folded because I thought, in a place full of so many retired people, you think they'd do a roaring trade, pardon me, but, and it, it didn't work. They I was told, up. actually, when Grace heard it was a funeral, I was told it was never actually going to be like an undertaker's place. It was going to maybe be what you might call a resting place yes. between death and funeral. Oh, right. You know, that's what I was told. Well, then I might be wrong. Still no, I have heard it was a funeral parlour because then they'd open up as a beautician and all the ladies were lying there with their cucumber on their face and, and cream and stuff and being done. And then it was like almost like being dead. Oh, come on. I do, I, there is a photograph I have in the year 2000 and it's for sale. I have a photograph looking down King's Road and it's for sale in the year 2000. It was all for sale for a long time. Mr. Wilson could not move that property. Right. He was a customer of mine in the bank, but he, he, could, he could not move that property. I think Properties were not moving just. I think Sinead Brennan told me she looked at the old tea house at one point years ago. Last man, going back to page 244, last man on the right, this very important man, that's Mr. Devenny. Devenny, yeah. That's Devenny. the hotel man who ran all the tours. I've heard of Devenny tours. Yeah. Oh, I. Oh, they were a big, t yeah. big thing. And, and to you the read the, the books here. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he, he ran tours. He had, he had, he had two hotels. Oh, they were all over Northern Ireland, yes. Uh, well, no, well, Whitehead was his, his main place. Uh, but he ran the tours here. It was mostly the uh, people from the Midlands came. It was English people. Uh, but he ran the tours then. They had all the buses Seven days of the week, there were buses going all over the place. Wow. But Mr. Devetti was uh, a big cheese in Whitehead. Hmm? I've painted that. Yeah, that was me. Did you? <laughs> I did a Imagine painting. Imagine me skipping over that. That's not <laughs> it. It's just oh, because it, I knew it wasn't Whitehead. It loses like a that. little in black and white, yeah. Yeah, so these um, are the men you were rattling off to me. 
I that yeah. was nineteen ninety nine. I had those Harold Black. Photographs. Yeah, that's Johnny McAdam from the Yacht Club, and that's Desmond Henshaw from the Yacht Club, and yeah. that's Basil Sherry. Couldn't get him. And I was lucky. I met Erskine Linton on the seafront in Linton. the oh. Manor House. He was a Boy Scout leader, and so he knew. Johnny McAdam and Basil Sherry from the Boy Scouts. Well, he, he knew them. I didn't know Sherry, but I, I, I knew and I knew Erskine Linton. Well, everybody yes. knew Erskine Linton. But there's what you didn't mention. didn't mention Black, Harold Black. Harold Gibson Black, yes. Yeah, oh, I... Betty Black, Martin's brother. Yeah, brother. yeah, yeah. yeah. you're right. Actually, mm-hmm. that is, Did you yeah. know him? Uh, um, no, no, I didn't know him, but I knew who he was. You yes. Know, I, knew, I, knew, I knew who he was. He died very young, didn't he? I think he was 23. Mm. Mm. And... I don't know. He may have died in America. I must talk to Benny it's Martin's... Cable Road? 36 Cable Road. Mm-hmm. It has a bit below me. I can't mm-hmm. remember just which, which house, house it was. Yeah. No, I, that's I, here. That's a prefab. That's a prefab. And that's Mooring. Those, those, those were built by Mr. Homes. Mr. Logan. Mm-hmm. Prefab Logan, he was known as. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was a builder. Hugh right. Logan. Hugh Logan Sr. because his son was Hugh Logan Jr. Mm-hmm. He was a great member of our church. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether he was a great, lovely singer, mm-hmm. very, very quality, good singer. Sang many a solo in Whitehead Presbyterian. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! But he was he was Hugh Logan. He mm-hmm. was Mr. Logan Jr. But Prefab Logan was his dad, and his dad built all these prefabs. Made a fortune. Made a fortune. Mm-hmm. Page two, three, that's, two. Mm-hmm. That's the old shelter, Long Beach Road. Mm-hmm. That was an area shelter. Oh, an air raid shelter yeah, on that's Beach that Road. Was, yeah, Beach is Road. The, is that that Campbellville? I don't know. No. That's uh, a Belgian shelter. Yeah. Thing. Oh, I re- oh, I yeah. It's not for, oh, no, that, 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 that's interesting now. Martin Cleary. Martin Cleary came here uh, in, the, in the army and he married, his wife became Peggy Cleary. Uh, lovely lady, lovely lady. He was an English spy, but he married her and he settled here and he had his home at Whitehead. But he was a, 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 an English army man who got based in Whitehead for a while. Oh, for goodness sake, would you look at those two at the bottom of Cable Road? Mm-hmm. Lovely big house there. Now, that's a, what was the Abbey Field House at the bottom of oh, Cable yeah, Road. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's where those were. Yeah. That, when they took that over, those, uh, those huts away, yeah. it left a smooth, con- not, it left, left a concrete base, right. which suited us for our roller skating. Ah, mm-hmm. roller skating. Oh, yeah. So no, wait a minute. You did cricket, you did rugby. Oh, well, everybody did... roller skated. And golfing. Oh, yeah. Is there any sport you did not do? Uh, nose picking. Oh. Nose... <laughs> well, I asked for that, didn't Is that I? a Nissan hut? That's a Nissan hut. Yeah, that's a Nissan hut. Mm-hmm. Nothing to do with the Japanese car of the same name. No, not, not, it, not, not, not <laughs> at all. Oh, but you, see, you see this book here. I mean, there's, there's two days talking in this book. I know. can remember that postcard. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. That's horrible. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yes, Trevor, thank you very much for your time.